the grouchy nerd. All right, you antisocial weirdos, it's time to learn a game that can play at the ideal player count. One. Everdale, designed by James A. Wilson and published by Starling Games and Tabletop Tycoon, who very kindly provided me with a copy of Everdale, and it's actually the Collector's Edition, which has a few upgrades, most notably Black Rat Workers, metal coins, and a few extra cards, none of which are necessary for solo play, and none of which am I going to use in this video, mostly because black meeples don't really look all that good on video, and the metal coins are quite shiny, uh, but they're nice. They're really nice and heavy. I use them. I'm just not going to film with them. I will, however, be using the large, fancy kind of marbly D8 that it comes with, because it's awesome. Everdell is a worker placement card drafting tableau builder, which sees you as the leader of a new settlement of amazingly illustrated anthropomorphic animals living in a thriving civilization in a hidden realm in the shadow of the Evertree, obviously. However, your idyllic little world is being threatened by a cantankerous old rat named Rugwort, who's trying to build his own thriving civilization, presumably with blackjack and hookers. The game is played, taking actions until you're no longer able over four seasons, and your goal in Everdell is to outscore Rugwort three times in three increasingly difficult games. It always feels bad going up against guys described as cantankerous. That's, that's my people. That's my kin. Also, if you don't want to commit to playing three games in a row, you can also just treat it as easy, medium, hard. It's three games in a row that get harder, but it's not like a campaign. Nothing carries over. It's just three harder games. I'm going to break free from the rule book here for a quick, uh, I don't know, a tip? A quick tip? A quick tip. It's a pretty sizable deck of cards in this game, so before you put the board out, you might want to use your play surface to mix the cards up. Give them a quick smoosh shuffle, which is when you put them all kind of face down, mix them all around for about a minute and gather them all back together again. That's called a smoosh shuffle. It's a great way to mix up a huge stack of cards, and it's fun to say. And then there's the optional extra time, making sure that all the card backs are facing the same way. But <laughs> who would do that? That's crazy. That would be a crazy thing to do. Place the board in your play area and assemble the tree and place it at the top of the board. I've seen some videos complain about the tree here. Um, I personally think it's really neat. All the art direction in this game is kind of incredible. It looks great. It's thematic. It, it works for what it does. I'm probably going to go on the Tabletop Tycoon website and order the one that's made of wood, actually, because I think it's really cool. Because I can't ask for that, right? No, <laughs> no, I can't ask for that. You'd be tacky, right? Yeah. Place the point and occupied tokens in piles beside the board. Place the twigs, resin, pebbles, and berries in separate piles along the river where indicated. Though, for the clutter-minded, you really only need the resources that you're going to pick up. Rugwort doesn't get any, so you just need, like, six to eight, maybe, of each. Along the river are the basic locations to which you can send workers. All locations are marked with this little paw print in an oval. If the oval is complete, the location is exclusive, meaning only one worker may occupy that location. But if the oval is open at the bottom, the location is shared, and multiple workers can go on that location, even workers of the same color. Now, in the solo game, Rugwort's worker locations are all predetermined by the game, which we'll go over here in a little bit, and he only goes on exclusive locations, so you're never going to be able to share with Rugwort, so it's really just that last bit that matters for you. You can put multiple workers on shared locations. Shuffle the forest cards, which are the small ones with forest clearings on the backside. Draw three and place them in three of the clearing spaces on the board, then put the rest back in the box. One clearing space will remain empty. Forest cards are also locations on which you can place workers, though the rewards they offer are generally much more powerful than the basic locations, like being able to take any two resources or discard cards to draw new cards. There's 11 of them and three go into play, so math that out and put it at the bottom. There's that many unique setups that you can have. Did you do it? Why? This symbol means this space is only available in a four-player game, and you're playing a two-player game, so just ignore that. Place the four basic events along the river. Then shuffle the special events, the small cards with branches on the back. Draw four to place on the lower branches of the Evertree, and put the rest back in the box. Events are also worker placement locations that have specific requirements that must be met in order to place a worker there. If you haven't yet, shuffle the main deck, deal eight of these cards to the meadow, and then place the rest in the Evertree itself. City cards are either constructions or critters, the buildings and little cuties that will make up your new settlement. I mean, citizens. 
I mean little cuties. Look at him. Look at his little face. I would die for that architect. That's a sentence I have never said before. Each city card has a name, the requirements to put it into play, how many points that card is worth at the end of the game, and its effects. Constructions in your town will allow you to play specific critters for free noted here. Those critters have a corresponding box here, telling you which construction will let you play it for free. Cards also have a type, traveler, production, destination, governance, or prosperity, which we'll get more into later. Construction and critter cards will also be either common or unique. You can have as many copies of common cards in your city as you want, but only one of each unique card. Choose a color between blue, orange, white, or brown for you and one for rugwort, or choose between turtles, squirrels, mice, and hedgehogs. Either choice is valid and understood. Place four workers for you and for rugwort on the top branch of the ever tree, one on the left, one in the middle, and two on the right each. Place one of Rugwort's remaining two on the three twig location, and place the other on the first forest card. You start with two workers. Draw five cards as the first player. And you have a hard hand size limit of eight in this game, and it is a hard hand size. If you have eight cards in your hand and something causes you to draw cards, you just don't do that. It's not a game where you draw up and then by the end of your turn you have to get down to eight or discard back down to eight. No, you just can't pick any more up. Rugwort does not draw cards. If anything would cause you to give cards or resources to an opponent, discard them instead. Resources to the supply and cards to this little cutout area. Though Rugwort will collect any point tokens you have to give him. Year one is against Rugwort the rascal. <laughs> what a rascal. Each turn plays thusly. Take one of three possible actions. Place a worker, play a card, or prepare for season. When placing a worker, you'll immediately gain something or take an action. Most often, this will be resources. Twigs, resin, pebbles, and berries. Though some allow you to gain points or draw cards. This symbol means any resource. And remember that forest cards are locations, but you can't go where Rugwort's worker is. Events are also locations, but they have a requirement you must meet before you can place a worker on them. Each basic event requires a certain number of cards of a particular type to have been built in your city. Three for traveler, destination, or governance, and four for production. Special events will list two specific cards that you must have in your city. If there's a cost, like the Croak Wart Cure, you must be able to pay it. Special events often have an action you can take when you achieve them and affect end game scoring. Rugwort will also get points for each of these special events that you do not achieve, so be sure to keep an eye on them. And you cannot place a worker on an event unless you are able to achieve that event. When you place your worker on the event, place the event near your city. Your worker's gonna stay on it for right now, but it's just a regular location. You're still gonna get that worker back when it's time to get workers back, or if you're able to reassign a deployed worker. If you take a special event, and then later in the game one of the two cards that was required to pick up that special event leaves play, the event still stays in your area. The event already happened, you don't lose it. Each time you place a worker on the haven, you'll discard any number of cards from your hand and take one resource of your choice for every two cards you discarded. The last location is only available in the autumn, the last season of the game. You may send a worker on a journey to score the listed number of points, but you also have to discard that number of cards from your hand. So if you don't have the cards in hand, you can't send a worker on the journey. But it is a great way to unload some unused cards right at the end of the game. You can also send as many workers as you want on journeys as long as you have the cards to discard, but do note that only the two journey location is a shared location. Play a card from your hand or the meadow by paying the listed cost in resources here. If you play a card from the meadow, replace it from the top of the deck. And the rules specify that you replace this card before you add the one that you took into your city. I don't know why, but it does. The cost of constructions will generally be some combination of twigs, resin, and pebbles, while critters cost berries, or having a specific construction in your city. Meaning you can essentially add a critter to your city for free, though each construction can only be used in this way once. When you play a critter for free, this way, place an occupied token on the location to show that it has already been used to bring in a critter for free. If, for some reason, a creature that was brought into play for free leaves play, that occupied token stays there. That location cannot then be used to bring in another critter for free. And that matching construction does list which critter it brings in for free, but it doesn't work the other way around. You can't bring the construction into play because you already have the critter. 
It doesn't go that way. You can only bring in a critter because you already have the construction. Each card will also have some kind of special ability or text. Tan Traveler cards activate immediately when played and never again, whereas Green Production cards will activate when played, then again during the spring and autumn seasons. Red Destination cards become new locations your workers can go to. Those that have this little open sign normally mean that another player can use that location, but we don't, we don't have one of those. That's why we're here. Blue Governance cards offer discounts or sometimes rebates when playing other cards, and Purple Prosperity cards get you sweet, sweet end game points. Think of them as seeds you're sowing to pay off later. Catch that? Because of the tree motif? I can be pretty deep. But each time you play a card, no matter what card type it was or whether or not you got to put it into play for free, Rugwort's gonna get to play a card too. The top left card in the meadows is one, the bottom right is eight. Roll the D8 and place the card matching the die's result in Rugwort's area. But keep each card type in separate stacks and set in a way that you can easily count how many cards are in each stack. Then replace that card from the meadow. The card's effect, how many points it's worth, and its uniqueness don't matter. Also, while you may be limited to 15 city cards in your tableau, Rugwort has no such limit. When you're out of workers and can't afford to play any more cards, you'll use the last action, prepare for season. Take your deployed workers back from the board and take the new worker in the spring area of the upper branches. Next, activate each production card in your city and gain whatever that card produces. When you're done, Rugwort gets to prepare for the season. Each season, you'll first check to see see if Rugwort has enough of any card type to achieve any of the basic events. If so, place that event in Rugwort's area. He doesn't have to send a worker to the basic event, he just gets them. Jerk. Place Rugwort's new worker on the top left meadow card, the one in the one position. This card is now blocked for you. Rugwort can still gain this card if you roll a one, but you cannot play it, draw it, or discard it. Move the worker that had been on the three twigs location to the two resin location, and move the forest card worker to the next forest card, moving counterclockwise. Then begin again at your turn. Preparing for the summer works basically the same way. You'll retrieve your workers and take the new one in the summer area of the top branches. But instead of your green cards producing, you'll draw two cards from the meadow. Draw them both, then replace them. But remember, you cannot take the card with Rugwort's worker on it. Rugwort's new worker goes on the card in the number two position, his resource worker moves to the pebbles location, and the forest worker will continue to the third forest card. When preparing for the autumn, you get two new workers and activate your production cards again. Rugwort's new workers go on the three and four cards in the meadow, this little worker moves to the one berry one card location, and this little worker goes all the way to the three point journey space. Play continues in this way until you've taken your last action, making sure to give Rugwort a final card if that last action was playing a card. Remember that you can only have a maximum of 15 cards in your city, though there are certain card pairs that only occupy one space, so you could have 16. And remember, too, that the journey spaces are a great way to get some points with leftover cards. Count up all the points on the cards in your city, plus any events that you achieved, and any point tokens you've collected along the way. And that's it. No points for leftover resources or anything like that, so make sure you use them. Rugwort gets two points for each of his cards, any points you may have had to give him, points for any basic events he achieved, plus the three points for his journey worker. He also gets three points for each special event that you did not achieve, which can be devastating. That might be 12 points if somehow you weren't able to get any of them. Whoever has more points wins. And if that's you, you move on to year two against Rugwort the Rotten. Year two works almost exactly the same as year one, except that Rugwort will take the four point journey space instead of the three, and he gets a nightmarish six points for each special event that you did not achieve. If you win, move on to year three against Rugwort the Rapscallion. He's gonna work basically the same as year two, except that he goes for the five point journey space. And instead of moving his worker to the one berry, one card space in the autumn, that worker kidnaps one of yours. Remove them both from the game. You now have to win with only five workers in the autumn. And if you manage it, then you have well and truly driven Rugwort away and Everdell can thrive once again in peace. Until, until the next time you play. No, he'll, he'll be back. And that's how to play Everdell solo. Now get out of my magical glade. The 
the grouchy nerd. So, um, quick update about the animals that live in my backyard. Uh, they do not... <laughs> They do not appear to have any kind of secret, weirdly advanced society. They do, however, have very sharp nails and teeth. And they don't like it when you try to get inside their little houses to see if they have a secret, weirdly advanced society. Unless they were hiding something. I must redouble my efforts.